Good afternoon to the Global Forest Summit from Paris that is co-organized by Reforest Action and the Open Diplomacy Institute under the high patronage of Mr. Emmanuel Macron, President of the French Republic. This is the, third se the fourth session of uh, today's summit that will revolve around forest and biodiversity. As you know, forests host more than 80% of vertebral species uh, uh, in their habitats. And uh, it is alarming that one million species are at now at immediate risk of, is, of extinction, as the UN Secretary General say. World wildlife population fell two thirds since the uh, 1970s, and in, in tropical regions, that, that accounts for 94% of loss of biodiversity. Forest can thus play an amazing uh, forest protection is at stake to, to, to achieve. Uh, biodiversity protection. Um, and to discuss this issue, I am pleased to host uh, prominent speakers from many different continents. I'll start with Dr. Isabella Texera, former Environment Minister of Brazil and now Chair of the International Resource Panel. Hi, Isabella. I do hope you hear us correctly. Yes, perfectly. Thank you very much. Welcome from Brazil. Uh, we also have Dr. Hans Bernix, uh, the Executive Director of the European Environment Agency. Hi, uh, Hans, I hope you're here with us. Absolutely, thanks, pleasure. Thank you. We have Virginie Helias, the Chief Sustainability Officer of Proctor & Gamble. Hi, Virginie. Morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm also very pleased to host Fran Price, the Global Forest Lead at WWF. Hello, Fran. Hello, great to be here with you. Thank you for being with us. Uh, we also have the pleasure to host uh, Dr. Maya Laura, who is a junk professor at AgroParisTech, as well as the chair of the scientific board of Ecofor. Hello, Maya. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you for this invitation. Thank you for being with us. Uh, I, I know the COVID-19 crisis, sometimes some bit of anxiety for getting all speakers on board and we finally made it the whole panel as well as with Chris Buzz, the Director of Forest Conservation Programme at the IUCN. Hello, Chris. Hi, Thomas. Thank you very much for the invitation. Please. We will have a, a, a one hour and a half discussion about this uh, uh, issue, forest and biodiversity, but to launch it, I have the pleasure, the great honor to host the Young Champion of the Earth in 2019, Luis Mabulo, who is speaking uh, from the Philippines. Thank you so much, Thomas, for a kind introduction. Louise, you're, you're fighting for future generations. We usually associate uh, future generations and the Fridays for Future movement to climate issues. But as we usually say in, in this summit, it's a twin crisis between climate and the environment. So I'm very curious on knowing why you've accepted to fight with us today uh, as we aim to protect and restore forests altogether. Uh, to speak about biodiversity. You have the free speech for 10 minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, so hello everyone, I'm Luis Mabulo. I'm from the Philippines and I'm the founder of the Cacao Project, which is my social venture aimed at equipping farmers and local communities for sustainable success. Now I live in a very remote area in, in the country where I'm in, where I'm fortunate that environmental degradation and loss of biodiversity has been somewhat limited due to our geographical location and due in part to our work. We're lucky compared to most of the rest of the world who don't have access to green spaces and rainforests like the ones that we do. And yet despite this, despite my community stewardship and our, our environment and our biodiversity, we are one of the most vulnerable regions in the world to hazards brought about by climate change. While people here, they're not even one of the large contributors to global CO2 emissions, and neither are we large contributors to biodiversity loss. December last year, my town was hit by one of the strongest typhoons and worst series of super typhoons we've ever seen, with winds reaching 300 kilometers per hour, and a new super typhoon brewing on the horizon every single week. And all of this poses massive threats and risks to our homes, our lives and our safety. And this happens to us in worsening intensities every single year. 
We realize now that countries like ours are sorely left behind when it comes to developing resilience, self-sufficiency and emergency plans, despite being at the forefront of the global emergency. We're also the most gravely impacted by decisions made for us by people across seas and oceans and different continents. So my work puts me at the front lines of our climate crisis, working with communities who are not only reliant to our soils, air and wind and sunlight, but also to our biodiversity. And they're also taking the brunt of some of the worst climate related disasters and hazards we'll ever see. So people here have lost their homes, their livelihoods, and to them, the effects of the climate crisis and biodiversity loss is very real and very present. And not, it's not some long away threat that we'll see in the next 50 years. It's something we experience day to day. In fact, communities here stare down the barrel of the gun, so to speak, and feel the immense urgency in restoring our biodiversity just to save their livelihoods and the ecosystems that we're poised to lose. Farming communities here and in many parts across the world, our biodiversity dictates our way of life. These forests are life givers. They're the source of our breakfasts, lunches and dinners, our income, it's our shelter. And these forests protect us from strong winds and typhoons. And the root systems help prevent flash flooding, landslides and droughts that we face because of the climate crisis. And preserving these ecosystems and these forests are, is, is becoming an uphill battle for people here. We face on a regular day-to-day -day basis. Biodiversity cuts through our peace and security, our food security, our agriculture, and our livelihoods. And I've witnessed the climate emergency and loss of biodiversity drastically affecting lives with increasing intensities of typhoons and with droughts that have put our food sources on the line. How unsustainable production has led to the degradation of our soils and risked existing livelihoods with the use of harmful chemicals uh, that would eventually leach into our water systems and that eventually cause health complications in village children. And for over three years now, I've run my social venture, which aims to create sustainable and resilient economic forests uh, for our farming communities and find nature-based solutions to increase their resiliency and improve their livelihoods and better support their families for sustainable success. But I also work with my community on restorative farming techniques that restore our soils that have been passed down for generations and marrying it with modern day techniques. And we try to keep our water sources as clean as possible. We try to plant more trees and equip farmers to be part of the mission to regenerate our lands. And yet we're still haunted by the knowledge that globally soils are degrading so drastically that we can lose our harvest in as little as 60 years because of soil degradation, or that we're also losing a football field worth of forest every three seconds around the world. And that will inevitably come to, to impact us in the, in the future and even every single year that we face it. And it doesn't just end in unsustainable practice, but the loss of ancestral land and indigenous knowledge that is fading into history due to the strive for industrialization, the demand for more outputs and the strive for rapid modernization without taking into account the role of ancestral knowledge and indigenous knowledge and caring for our landscapes. So knowledge like whistling for the wind to come or utilizing local resources to build sustainable agroforests that work with nature to produce better harvest is getting lost. Nature-based solutions that have been passed down from generations are also getting lost because green jobs are discouraged among young people due to deeply rooted cultural stigmas. And for real and holistic solutions, we need to integrate environmentalism into every aspect of our world system. We can't just set aside land for biodiversity and call it a day. We need to make our food systems biodiverse so that we're creating better produce while restoring our ecosystems. And we need to be inclusive to the global south who are also the backbone of production and address that they are key players in saving our, our environment and, and our planet. And also we mustn't alienate these industries that are also accused for global deforestation and climate change and biodiversity loss, but instead embrace them into the fold so that they can begin doing their part in the transformative journey for a more equitable planet, because inevitably all businesses must be sustainable if we want to continue living. And we also need consumers, on the other hand, 
to dictate and be informed about their decisions and its impacts to our environment, knowing full well that consumer decisions drive demands and drive markets. So in the rush to look forward, we usually forget to reach back and look to our roots in the numbers and statistics of all of these people who are impacted by biodiversity loss. We also lose the human face and the real stories of the individuals who experience these things day by day and who are the subject of these talks and discussions. And I stand here today as one of those faces. I speak here for the communities that are not satisfied to simply be statistics and numbers in reports uh, and, and discussions like these. They're unsatisfied that they're portrayed as victims to a global systemic problem. Instead, through my work, we're empowering them to be agents of change and stewards to creation. Because the future we build is the future that we deserve. And if we are to build a better world, we need to build biodiverse food systems. We need to have green landscapes so children can grow up to love and understand nature where they are in their own localities. And we need to create space for biodiversity and give our planet the space it needs to heal. So now is the time for accountability for our landscapes. Now is the time to demand and pass policies that protect the communities, who restore our biodiversity and create systemic change that addresses the root of the issues we face and build solutions that are tailor fit to the communities and enable them as actors and gatekeepers and holders of solutions and not as beneficiaries to short-term aid. With the summit taking place at the onset of the decade of restoration, I sincerely expect as a young person and a person working in the environmental field that the discussions laid out here will break new ground for conservation and preservation of biodiversity and that audiences who are watching right now can be fueled to act as stewards of creation and hold accountability for our well-being and the future of our planet. So thank you very much and God bless. Over to you, Thomas. Thank you very much, Luis. That is a, a powerful speech you've made. I, I've taken some notes. I'm, 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 I'm so impressed of your leadership. Um, you, you've been speaking about this global emergency that echoes why we're now entering this UN decade for ecosystems restoration with a strong will of getting to action. This should be the decade of action. That, that's the purpose of this Global Forest Summit. You've also shown that there is, a much, there is much thought leadership in being a social entrepreneur on the ground, working with local communities to restore the lands, and that it needs to be in fully integrated, as we discussed in our previous panel, and as we'll discuss in the next panel about, uh, about forest and the economy to global supply chains. Your, business, your social business on the ground is part, or can be uh, part of the, of the answer to this, uh, to this issue. To address this question of forest and biodiversity, uh, we have uh, many prominent speakers that I already introduced you with, and we'll try to revolve around the keynote that uh, Luis Mabulo just uh, uh, addressed to us. First, the, question, the first question I, I'd like to ask is, is, is meant for Fran Price from WWF. Fran, we know definitely that deforestation is a clear synonymous of mass biodiversity loss. Uh, WWF has been uh, reviewing this for years and years, and still we need the figures to understand what is at stake. Could you let us know uh, uh, how WWF has captured this issue recently? Thank you so much. And it really is an honor to be with you and to uh, hear Louise um, and others uh, speak to the heart of the issues that we're, we're all grappling with. So thank you. So first I wanna say that uh, climate change and biodiversity loss are really two sides of the same coin and we cannot fix one without fixing the other. It's all intertwined and interrelated. Uh, and um, to go into a little bit more detail um, on, on where we are in terms of biodiversity loss, in 2020, WWF put out its latest living planet report. And we put these reports out every two years and they track over uh, 21,000 populations of wildlife um, around the globe. And this year, uh, the, the numbers showed us that there's been an average of 68% 
decline in those populations since 1970. When we look at forest dependent species, at forest specialists, those numbers have gone down by 53%. Um, so freshwater is even, uh, freshwater species are even worse off than, than forest dependent species, but uh, none of them are doing well. Um, and these, these species population trends are really important because they are an indicator of overall ecosystem health. And what they're telling us is that nature is literally unraveling before our very eyes. Um, and the planet is flashing red lights of system failure to us. So um, habitat loss, including deforestation and unsustainable land use um, is the primary driver of biodiversity loss. It also is a, uh, one of the drivers, main drivers of climate change. And it's the biggest underlying uh, factor when we think about the emergence of new infectious diseases like COVID-19. It also has a relationship to fire. And now with habitat loss, with climate change, we're seeing fires that are larger, that are uh, of longer duration, and that are uh, bigger than we've ever seen and more intense than we've ever seen before. So despite all the commitments that we have from governments and, and companies, um, we are uh, continuing to see deforestation and forest degradation rise. Um, we have uh, over the period of 2004 to 2017, we lost a forested area the size of California or Morocco. Every year we lose uh, a forest the si twice the size of Costa Rica. Um, and behind these numbers are real impacts on lives, on livelihoods, on, on cultures of millions of indigenous peoples and local communities. So the, the future of people, the future of wildlife, the future of nature as a whole is dependent on forest health. And there's no way to meet any of our global targets, whether they be the climate targets under the Paris Agreement or the Sustainable Development Goals, or the global biodiversity framework without addressing our relationship to nature and our relationship to forests. Um, so how do we how do we move forward? Um, this is a, a, you know an incredibly complex and multi multifaceted uh, challenge. We need integrated approaches. We need multi sectoral approaches, yeah. and we need collective action. That is something we will build on, of course, on, in the course of our discussion. But uh, I'd like to pick up the, the, one of the words you've pronounced, which is for everyone very easy to figure out of what it does mean, the figures, the, the dramatic figures that you've laid out, fires. Um, when, we, when we think of fires, we obviously think of Amazon fires that we have uh, at an increasing um, uh, volume and length, etc. And you, you, you took this example, with, which is very meaningful, because you said biodiversity loss means uh, f uh, wildfires that long last and are more difficult to solve. Which brings me to Isabella Teixeira, who is uh, Minister of the Environment uh, in Brazil uh, during the Dilma Rousseff's administration, and who is now co-chair of the International Resource Panel. Isabella, I'd like to ask you, You've been trying to fight against deforestation in Brazil for a couple of months, a couple of weeks, a couple of years. And you still keep, though, uh, despite you no longer belong to the government. Um, what are the lessons that you've taken from uh, the case of the Brazilian Amazon deforestation when it comes to biodiversity? How do you, how do you import those lessons in, in now the International Resource Panel uh, work? Hey, thank you very much, friends, for this question. First of all, uh, good morning again for my friend, for the panelists. Hello, my dear friend uh, 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 Hans, that uh, is today with me, with us, sorry. And uh, thank you very much, Francis, for your words, and also uh, Louise, because she brought uh, a good perspective to consider local needs and how local needs uh, will dialogue, we should dialogue with global core benefits. So when you bring together these issues, of course, that my experience is it's not only related to Amazon vision, but of course, that we have a key interest to today globally. 
how we can manage Amazon region, not Amazon basin, not only in Brazil, but of course, Brazil has around 65% of Amazon basin territory. And indeed, what it means? Indeed, uh, my first observation that I, during my term, my administration have the lowest rates of deforestation in Amazonia. So I know a lot what's happened there. And indeed, how huge is our challenge to stop deforestation, okay, to how to go against but also on the other side of the coin, how we go into Amazon region to promote sustainable development, how we can go into the new futures, how indeed we manage 25 million people that live there. Okay, so in Brazil, we have 25 million people that live in Amazon region. Okay, you have nine states. Okay, you have 808 municipalities. 80% of this population lives in cities. So it's absolutely important that you can understand the dimensions of how we manage deforestation because it's not only the, in the forests that is full protect that illegal activities. You have the pressure from the social and economic dynamics of the region that we need to review. We need to understand the demands, how indeed we can bring the new economies, the new green economies, and how we review the economic development in that region that unfortunately has the lowest rates of developing human index in Brazil. So the richest region in my country has the lowest uh, human development in Brazil. So we have a huge contradiction when we have to bring things together and to understand, as was, ma was mentioned before, uh, biodiversity loss together with climate change and also with pollution, okay, they are linked. With the three global environmental crises, they are linked in the Amazon region because you have degradation also and you have mercury uh, contamination in the rivers. And so it impact the health, it impact the quality of the health of the forest, the health of the system and health of the human society that lives there. But also deforestation go into the ecological equilibrium of the forests, of the diversity of systems that we have there. And you can bring arbovirus, new impact, new perspective of pandemics around the world. So it's absolutely critical that we can understand how we can face this in this moment that unfortunately you have this backsliding considered deforestation, how you tackle deforestation. I think that you've made a very clear portray of the very twin crisis I, I, I described and that Fran has also uh, laid out. It's, it's intertwined biodiversity loss and uh, climate disruptions. We can't achieve one against the other or one before the other. And, that, and we, we, we talk, when we talk about that, it brings us back to the, the part of the roots uh, to sustainability uh, policy design that is again based in Brazil. Uh, let's, let's look back from uh, Rio Summit 1992 that, um, that designed the idea of a sustainable forest management. Um, I'm, I'm going to turn to Maya Leroy, who is professor at AgroParisTech. You've been uh, reviewing the history of addressing biodiversity in international forest policy since the idea of the sustainable forest management. Did, did we, do you think that we believe we, we had set the right framework at the time, or is it inefficient? Thank you for giving, to giving me the opportunity to talk about this major issue, which is maintaining the biodiversity of forest because I would like to advise us here the issue of implementation, and in particular, the implementation of the major principles set out in Rio Conference, which for forests were those of sustainable forest management. Because although there was no convention on forest after Rio Conference, and like the convention on biodiversity, climate change, or the fight against desertification, the concept of sustainable forest management has nevertheless financed many activities, projects, programs, policies throughout the world for 30 years. So sustainable forest management policies, programs and projects should have helped to curb deforestation and maintain biodiversity by combining economic, social and environmental aspects. However, the situation is not really improved from the point of view of forest, with 13 million hectare a year lost, even if we are currently seeing a slight decrease. So with 30 years of hindsight, it is now possible 
to make an inventory of these actions, of these management arrangements, and to assess their effectiveness with regard to the challenges of maintaining biodiversity. In fact, our research shows that there is a limited range of management arrangement that declined the concept of sustainable forest management in an operational way. The three main categories are sustainable forestry, by which we mean improvement of forestry methods, the enhancement of forest carbon stocks and make carbon storage pay, and increasing the involvement of local population. But what do these management arrangements show with regards to forest biodiversity issues? That is, the forestry sector that can and should regular, uh, regulate deforestation? Its doctrine is quite simple. Forestry must allow, by means of economic val valorization, the long-term maintenance of forest, avoidance of conversion. So sustainable forestry, improving forest harvesting, will almost automatically improve forest biodiversity. But 80% of deforestation comes from the agricultural sector. No measures are suggested, no slow down to slow down this dynamic. So moreover, no management arrangement is especially geared towards protecting biodiversity and light carbon storage. It could be argued that sustainable forestry takes care of it, this, but not even the scientific literature approaches biodiversity through the maintenance and conservation of harvested biodiversity, marketable spaces, the harvesting of which is not always sustainable. So the issue of wildlife and its habitat, it's barely addressed, even though some forestry concession have dedicates areas for wildlife. So in practical terms, protected areas are rarely associated with the concept of sustainable forest management and tension also persists between sustainable forest management focused mainly on logging and an environmental conservation sector perceived as a potential block, uh, as a potential block on the industry development. So let us return to carbon sequestration scheme. They have an explicit environmental objective, huh? reduction of greenhouse gas emission, but some consider carbon as an umbrella thing that would de facto include biodiversity, but many field cases show that this is not necessarily the case, especially not for plantation. And finally, the case of participatory mechanisms vary greatly from one country to another, depending on the social economics, ecological context. With regards to biodiversity, a diagnosis must be made in each situation. And the rhetoric that claims that local customary knowledge or practices based on ancestral knowledge contribute greatly to preserving biodiversity needs to be investigated in each case. So in conclusion, the concept of sustainable forest management has been translated into a fairly small number of management arrangements which have been implemented, but they do not intervene on the main drivers of deforestation and they do not really take biodiversity into account, unlike to the challenge of climate change. So we should not be surprised that in 30 years, the biodiversity of forests, especially tropical forests, has deteriorated significantly. Thank you, Maya. This is very clear that, that we understand indeed that sustainable uh, management of forests uh, has not encapsulated biodiversity uh, from design, by design, I should say. And I, I usually also say that um, the biodiversity issue is not only about what we call wildlife. It is much bigger than this. So speaking about forests and biodiversity needs to encapsulate another aspect uh, than, than, than wildlife. And that is why I, I'd like to turn to Hans Bernix, who is the, the executive director of the European Environmental Agency. Uh, I know, uh, Hans, that you're working a lot on uh, 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 trying to study the ecosystem services that forests provide uh, that is based actually on their 
on inside biodiversity, biodiversity in forest habitats, which, which is much bigger than wildlife. It's also about uh, veg other vegetables, champignons, etc., etc. Could you tell us uh, on, 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 on the research you're carrying on, uh, on their objectives, as we usually speak about the need for car benefits between protection and conservation of nature and getting the most out of ecos ecosystem services? Yes, thanks, uh, Thomas, and thanks for the invitation. I, I would like to answer by picking up on some of the things that the previous speakers have already mentioned. Fran, I think, rightly emphasized uh, that there are two sides of the same coin, climate change and biodiversity. And, and although that goes against logic, I would say there are four sides to that coin, because you can also add resource use. And that's, of course, where the International Resource Panel is also putting the focus, the, the fundamentally unsustainable resource use on this planet. And there are large demands on biomass for the future, because we're thinking about a bio-based economy, bio-based chemistry, building more with uh, forest materials. We will get our clothing out of it, our, uh, the molecules that we will need. So the question becomes more and more that type of ecosystem service, because that is a service in and of itself as well. Does it add up if you add it all up? And I think that's, that's the third part of, of the coin. And then the fourth dimension, I think, is the social dimension. Uh, at the end of the day, we rely on ecosystems for uh, human health and well-being. And I think Louise has made that case very strongly. So when, when we look at forest ecosystems, we don't look at trees. You know, we, we look at forest ecosystems that deliver a multitude of benefits to society in the natural cycle. There is a lot of focus now on uh, the carbon cycle where forests play a, a key role, the climate regulation uh, where forests and oceans combined play a major role in that cycle, the water cycle. Uh, this is uh, sometimes an underestimated part. Yeah, but for, I, I, I like to stress this fact. You, you've clearly said, and that's also what Fran uh, said earlier, is that uh, forest management and forest protection or reforestation is not only about offsetting carbon emissions. It's much no. bigger than this. It is it, to protect yeah. something that brings us, that delivers much more than offsetting and that has uh, an inestimable value for health and for biodiversity. Could, could you insist a bit on what, because the notion of ecosystem services is, is sound clear, but it, it's, it's very complex at the end. And uh, we, we would need to better understand and figure out what an ecosystem service is. Water, the benefits of, of the multiple benefits of biodiversity, whether it's in the medical field or in the food field or in, uh, you know, uh, fertilization, natural. Uh... There is there is so much that is embedded in these ecosystems. And when you make the link to health, we, we spontaneously think now maybe of uh, pandemics and of the large uh, forests, but in many places in Europe, there is a, a, a sort of movement for local forests close to people, because we know that, that forests uh, close to urban lifestyles provide benefits when it comes to mental health, when it comes to uh, making people move. So I think forests play a specific role also in a socio-ecological system that is different where Louise lives uh, from where, uh, where if you live in Paris, or if you live in the countryside. So I, I think if we understand the, the complex uh, services that we get from healthy forest ecosystems, then we, we come much closer to understanding why uh, ecosystem-based management is actually the basis for anything we do in the future with, uh, with uh, forests. And we've been at this for, for decades. In Rio, we had the, the Rio Forest Principles. Since, since then, every big company is part of the World Business Council of Sustainable Development. Uh, they're all standing behind principles. We have three decades of uh, certification. And yet, we are where we are today. We see three decades of further decline in biodiversity, including in forest ecosystems and biodiversity. So the real question under the SDG promises or the European Green Deal is, 
what will we do radically different in the next decades that apparently we haven't done in the previous decades. Although the fundamental science was there, the fundamental understanding was there, and even the commitment, at least in principle, of key actors was there. So I think that's where it will really matter in the next decade. That is a very important thing. And I'd like to stress the fact that we usually get questions on why there should be businesses part of this discussion that is a more political discussion. But uh, the awareness that has risen, as you pointed out, is also getting momentum because um, some businesses are biodiversity driven businesses. Their success, the success of their product, of their services, uh, depend on what nature has to offer that we need to protect, to care for, to restore and, and to conserve. This is the case of the company that you represent, um, uh, Virginie Helias. I recall that you are Chief Sustainability Officer at Procter & Gamble. I'd like to know what, what, it, what does this uh, awareness rising mean for your business and how it has changed your governance as well as your supply chains? Thank you, Thomas, for having me. Um, actually, some of your viewers may be wondering why a consumer goods company is speaking about biodiversity amongst those uh, prestigious experts today. And I must say, it's very humbling. Um, well, if we do it, it's, it's indeed because our existing supply chain, uh, we use wood pulp for tissue products and, and palm oil, uh, in particular for our personal care and cleaning products. So our, our supply chain uh, today touches upon areas where biodiversity is a concern, you know, and, and, and we want to be part of the solution. And also, as Ruiz reminded us today, there is also a role we can play to raise awareness among the, the general public as we touch, we touch 5 billion people, 5 billion people every day around the world uh, through our brands. So what do we do? Um, we have a corporate commitment to healthy forests, which begins with our supply chain, but it doesn't end there. You know, we, we reach beyond our footprint through, through projects that um, have the objective to protect and, and to restore uh, important ecosystems. So, uh, you know, responsible sourcing is one pillar of our goals, Ambition 2030 goals, and, and it's driven by a commitment to zero deforestation in our supply chain, but also respect for the rights of indigenous people and workers and, and protection of biodiversity. You know, this is the foundation. And from that, um, we, we drive additional projects uh, that improve the livelihoods and, and, and the biodiversity beyond our supply chain. So a few examples on this. So for instance, we source um, a large volume of palm oil and palm kernel oil from Malaysia. And we have a program there with small holders, small holders farmers, um, and it's to help them increase their yield by 30% and, and to help them also adopt, you know, sustainable practices. And our plan is to have 250 learning farms by the end of this year, we already have 20, 25 today, where the farmers will, will gain expertise in, in good agricultural practice and also, you know, fertilizer management and water management. And, and we will use these learning farms to diffuse the good practices and, and touch up to 8,000 farmers over two years, you know, uh, we will run in the field uh, training. And, and this year, it's the first year, the learning showed that uh, there is an increase of 22% of yield and an increase of their annual income of 13.5%. So we can do both, you know, more um, sustainable practices, uh, increase livelihood uh, and, and increase their yield. Uh, also last week, you know, so it's very recent, we announced a partnership with WWF uh, in Malaysia. Uh, we partner with their, on their uh, tiger conservation program, which looks at, at protecting, restoring critical habitats for tigers uh, in West Malaysia. And that's beyond our supply chain. And, and, and the program is, is of course designed to ensure that both tiger habitat and local farmers benefit from it. And, and we also go to other parts of the world to, to help restore forests. You know, we are planting more than a million trees through partnership in more than 35 countries. You know, and, and many of those forests are, have been uh, damaged. We've talked about it by wildfires, diseases, and degradation of all sorts. You know, for, for instance, we, we work with the uh, Arbor Day Foundation in California to, to restore the damages done by the wildfire there. 
And each time we have a, a sponsorship by one of our brands, you know, because we are a company of brands. So this one is, is uh, charming, our tissue brand that is sponsoring. In, in Australia, we work with WWF to restore lands in what's called the Koala Triangle, uh, also forest damaged by fires. And that's a program that is sponsored by our shampoo brand, OC. And, and finally, we work with uh, Reforest Action in France, uh, in Tanzania, in Kenya, with Pumper. So that's just a few of the, of the projects and the partners that, that we work with. I'd like to insist on, on two aspects and get you with more details, because this is very important to understand the way corporate responsibility is making a, a major change in addressing the issue. My first question is, is that um, you've been touching upon the difference between uh, reforestation and forest restoration, which is huge. And your, your forestry uh, uh, responsibility is not only about reforesting, it's also about restoring ecosystems, right? So I'd like you to detail a bit about how you've entered this new aspect of your CSR and sustainable yes. policy. The other aspect I, I'd like to touch upon uh, that we've already been discussing with few speakers uh, from the corporate sector this morning is that we hear uh, an ambitious of being net zero to net zero deforestation. Uh, but this means uh, there is still a bit of deforestation that we balance between what we deforest and what we reforest. How about having a positive uh, forestation policy? Is that invisible? Uh, could we envision that at some point in the next years to come, companies like PNG could get to a positive uh, objective of forestation? That's, that's a great question, Thomas. And, and we are actually engaged with WWF on their program of uh, forest positive, you know, which is exactly what you manage. And, and our um, uh, objective on, on our uh, forest uh, supply chain is that for every tree we use in our, pro in, in our product, at least one is regrown where it's at harvesters, you know? So, so it is the concept of, um, you know, by, by working with experts and, and by working with people around forest management, we uh, are seeking actually a net positive action. So, so this is absolutely the, the intention. And this is why we work with, with those partners, WWF, Conservation International. And to your first question, um, this is a, a fairly a recent uh, uh, approach for us, but we um, last uh, summer, we announced that uh, we will be carbon neutral for the decade in, in our operation. And the way we do that is first by reducing our, our own emission, you know, by over 50%. And then for the one that we cannot compensate, it's about investing uh, in natural climate solution. And, and again, because we are not experts in this, we are working with partners so that um, they know the best practice to select and fund the project. And to your question, we make sure that those projects cover the full spectrum of, you know, protection, uh, improve land management and uh, and restoration, you know, and and they help us uh, choose a portfolio of, of projects that actually uh, do all that. Now, when when we talk with um, about brand facing or consumer facing program, it's obviously a bit easier to talk about trees because people can picture it. It is a bit of a proxy for saying, you know, um, uh, forests are important and this is how you can help. But obviously, we, uh, we look at the full spectrum, uh, starting with, with protection of, of the existing uh, forest ecosystem. It's interesting what you said is that uh, I take away the word reduction. We, we've been very critical in our own manifesto about the fact that forest could be seen only as a way to offset CO2 emission. Reduction of uh, CO2 emission first is better than offsetting it. Carbon compensation comes after reduction. In the same fashion, uh, restoring forests and reforestation itself come after conservation of nature. And that is why I'd like to turn to, to Chris Bass, uh, who is the director of uh, the Forest Conservation Program at the IUCN. Um, Chris, do you, do you, you work in this international multi-stakeholder organization that, that protects biodiversity? Do you believe, as we head towards the uh, uh, World Nature Congress in Marseille in France next September, 
that nature conservation first is the ambition of everyone around Earth? Oh, thanks, thanks, Thomas, and 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 thanks for all the the great in, uh, discussions so far. I think um, you're you're hearing a, a lot of lot of practical solutions and opportunities. Uh, you mentioned you. It's interesting you should say nature first, and I, I, I you know, IUCN. We've been driving uh, the forest landscape restoration approach with with many actors globally. With WWF started many years ago. Um, and, and that's got fantastic traction through the Bond Challenge regional initiatives and then through to you know, support to the UN decade. Um, also driving nature-based solutions and nature-based solutions to poverty alleviation, climate change, what are the societal challenges that you're doing? So, so there's many different ways of looking at, 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 at how we use nature. And you know, we can use, the, perhaps just to very simply put, you can use it as a solution, you can use it as as also, you know, as also we need to protect nature. Um, and, and I think, you know, despite uh, that strong background that I talk of the solutions on the restoration and the, and the, the nature-based solutions, it's, it's, it is, it's critical that we think about you know, how, we, we're, how we're protecting what we've also got as well. And I think we're beginning to hear a th constant thread through this of, you know, looking at that mitigation hierarchy where you are protecting, where you are mitigating your footprint, the, the, the sustainable management, and the, and the, and then then restoring. But what is it at the base of, of that protection that we can do? The deforestation free principles, etc., that that people are driving and and practices with the private sector. Um, but quite often, and you see it, you know, it's our tendency to look at solutions, to look at opportunities, and 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 that's fantastic. But quite often, we are losing our, sometimes our focus on the, the the role and function of primary forests, and how we can how we can protect intact forest systems, and um, whether that be just understanding the value. And I think through hands and others, we've heard about well, how we need to have greater recognition of 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 forests in in national policies and. And, and that policy coordination to develop specific targets and indicators to drive that on um, and and really having more targeted approaches I think we've now heard that two or three times about how we respond to local conditions um, you know the the, the, the conditions that the, the need for protecting those forests for driving those forests um, we hear a lot about climate change. Fran said it the two, two sides of the coin, you know, the, 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 the nature, the biodiversity and the climate, um, but also you know, primary forests, intact forests give a, a provide a strong solution to, to, to climate change. They, the, the tropical forests capture more, 35% more than other types of forests. It's, uh, they provide a great opportunity. And so primary forests, intact forests do present a fantastic nature-based solution for climate change and that, that capturing as well. Um, but also, perhaps I, one, one interesting word we haven't heard too, too much of so far is that word financing, and how we can finance that that conservation and protection, and where is where is it coming from? And there's figures such as less than two percent of climate change mitigation um, is available for protection and conservation of of um, of of forests. And when you see a lot going into the, to the agricultural systems, the farming systems, and I'm not saying that's wrong. Far far from the opposite of saying that's wrong. Just you know, we we also need to drill down on some of the the other opportunities that we can bring because perhaps the tension is is high, highly skewed to the to the agricultural systems and and to the restoration and that's that that is you know that's that's where where all our hearts are leading to but we just need to think about how we work with the with the, the how do we allocate some of the financing to primary forests and intact forests and and I and we've we've heard heard it. You know, through three or two, three or four times now, Louise mentioned it right at the beginning about indigenous peoples, local communities, and landscape approach. How we bring those in and restore, and how we build stronger governance systems, improve uh, formal recognition of rights of indigenous and local communities, and really get that balance and trade-offs of what the local stakeholders need. And and then more pertinently, is what is the role of of primary forests in in the the, the, the recovery and rebuild um, of the present cri crisis we're going through, the global pandemic um, on COVID-19, and you know, how, what is the role of, of intact ecosystems, the threat to ecosystems, but also the consequence of not, not um, protecting those ecosystems. So you know, we need to make sure in recovery that we're putting plans in to, to safeguard and protect these ecosystems.
That, that is a very strong point about the green recovery that we've been debating for so long. It's, it's indeed a point we've not made so far all, uh, today. Uh, but I'd like to stress the fact that we've discussed about nature conservation first, because it has been fairly discussed the whole day. Humankind is not cl clever enough to, to, to make ecosystems benefits and, and services as well as nature did themselves itself. So uh, I'd like to turn back to, to Hans Bernicks, uh, director, executive director of the EEA, is that when it comes to restoration, meaning that human intelligence is trying to replicate what the ecosystem delivers for us in forests, are we able to maximize co-benefits just like nature does, or do you see many limits? How far we can, can we go to, 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 to in, in the restoration? Well, first of all, I'd like to say that uh, the fact that restoration is now embedded in the European policy setting, the biodiversity strategy, and will be linked to binding uh, legal frameworks is a significant step forward. Because we know that forest uh, ecosystem protection, preservation, whatever we do, it has been notoriously weak when it comes to binding legislation in many contexts, also internationally for decades. And so this is a big step forward. Now, translating that in action in Europe will, to a large extent, uh, be determined by what do we call forest ecosystem restoration. This is not planting trees. It is uh, working on forest ecosystems. And of course, trees play a role in that. But that is a, a fundamental understanding. A second. Uh, understanding is that a lot of that in a rather densely populated uh, part of the world will depend on land uh, practices and how we make decisions about uh, spatial planning and how we connect uh, parts of forest ecosystems that exist because it's this ecosystem connectivity that will create stronger ecosystems that can then grow into uh, something that will indeed deliver the benefits and the co-benefits that you are talking about. So translating the, the generic concept of ecosystem restoration and forest restoration in tangible, measurable, monitorable uh, elements, I think will, will be crucial. And as an agency, we will play a role also through new technology like uh, earth observation in, in monitoring what is actually happening in terms of, of that forest uh, restoration. I need I need to 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 wrap it there uh, to and to turn to Isabella because I know she has commitments at at UNEP that she needs to 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 rush off. Um, Isabella, you've been minister of the environment in Brazil. Let's let's hope that at some point you could be in power again and in charge of reforestation <laughs> program. How how would you set the ambition uh, for for the Amazon and for Brazil uh, in in such a case where we have devastated uh, this region? Oh, this is a good question. First of all, I don't want to be back, okay? It's enough. <laughs> but second, uh, it was it, we live six years with hard work. But I think that we need to understand that we have two different challenges in Amazon region when you discuss Amazon protection. The first one is just that I call how we can stop the illegal deforestation. Part of around 90% of the deforestation in Amazon region, 95%, is based on the illegalities. This is environmental crime. This is law enforcement, okay? This is also together with organized crime in that region. So it's a huge task to go there and to, again, stop backsliding that helping. Uh, it's, it's, it's today happening in Brazil and also put this on the right track. This is something how we can stop and how you can tackle the first stage. The other side is, okay, we need to restore because we have degraded areas, not only the, 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 the forested area, but to have fragmentation in the forest. And you have an important national program in Brazil, really one that we call Terra Class. And you take, you took a photo, what's happening in the degraded area, the forested area in Brazil. You have around 22 millions of hectares on native restoration, okay? It's impressive the dimension of Amazonia. So we need to understand how we can use not to protect areas that were preserved. One program, the National Protect Areas in Amazonia, we protect six millions of hectares under conservation. How we can bring these things together? The other side is how we can come 
with the economic carbon, the formal one, based on activities that economic activities that you have in Amazonia, and you change this, consider low carbon economy, consider new green economies, how you can use bioeconomy, how indeed you can use circular economy to have natural resource efficiency, based on, for example, in mining, that you have in a mining industry, not illegal mining, but mining industry that you have in Amazonia. So we need to understand how we can connect things based on forest conservation, and indeed how we use Amazon as an Amazon conservation as an asset for Brazil development. Today, unfortunately, Brazil is still have my opinion, and the, we as population, you don't understand the challenge that you have in Amazonia, people that don't live in Amazon region. And so we need to connect things and also in my last comment here to have a regional approach, bring another countries for Amazon basing together. We need to use science, the scientific knowledge, our, everything that you learned the last 40 years, how indeed you can address solutions, consider local needs, national interests and global core benefits. So it's a different perspective. I like too much what Hans mentioned, what indeed uh, uh, we need to do in the future that we didn't do in the past. Okay, what, you, what uh, how we learn the process and indeed how we concretely based on, on the reality. We cannot forget that to have different political, social and economic realities. It's not to a national one that I want to change. No, we need to change with the Amazon people on board. They need to argue what they want to do because they live there. Indigenous people, traditional people, uh, 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 people from Quilombolas, that from the black people. We need to understand how we can bring these people that live in Amazonia, their voice. The indigenous people in Amazon, Brazil and Amazon, we speak 240 languages. It's more than nine nations. So we have people that live there. We need to understand they will promote their development. We need to assist based on forest conservation. Forest is not on forest, not only trees, because we have other ecosystems there. But my feeling is that Brazil wants to be in, on board into this century. In the international, new international arrangements at the global level, Brazil needs to bring Amazonia preserved and Brazil needs to understand the role of Amazonia for an innovative way for our sustainable development in our culture. So as a, not a minister of the environment, but as somebody on the government, I will really uh, fight to bring Amazon people on board and to have innovative vision to promote sustainable development, consider the different regions in Amazon. We have four different situations. We have consolidated areas on deforestation, people that live there more than 50 years, promoted by the public policy. You have this mobile frontier of the deforestation. You need to stop this, you need to restore. You have the urban Amazon, you have the Amazon preserved, where we have indigenous people who had the rights. We need to bring human rights agenda together. It's absolutely important that as a target, not trying to protect the forest, how to raise human development in the Amazon region. It's absolutely important. If not, again, you have passive and not this as an asset. It is an important asset, not only for the global security, okay, climate security, biodiversity security, but this is an asset for our ID as a, so a society that is aligned with the contemporary needs. So I'm sorry I have to leave, okay? Sorry, as I mentioned before. I thank you so thank much, Isabella, much. for articulating the global, local, and regional aspects of it. I know you have to rush for a UNEP meeting, so thank you for having it, accepting our invitation. Despite that, we'll keep running the conversation uh, without you. We wish you best luck for the job you do at the International Resource Panel. Uh, and if, if building on what uh, Isabella Bye. just said, uh, goodbye, Isabella. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Sorry. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Uh, building on what Isabella just said, uh, I'd like to turn to Fran Price. Uh, she, Isabella was very vocal on the fact that we need to learn lessons from uh, what we hear from the ground and, and, and what we, we, the ancestral uh, knowledge that we had that Louise also referred to. Uh, in that sense, um, uh, for the sake of biodiversity, but also for the sake of climate change uh, combat, uh, diversification of forests, mixed species uh, uh, plantations, 
This is key to restore forest and to protect biodiversity. Do you share this concept and, and how, how has the WWF uh, reviewed the, the, this importance of uh, diver, diverse uh, species in, in forest programs? Thank you, thank you, Thomas. Um, this is a very important issue and it's very integrated into the approach that we take at WWF. So Chris mentioned forest landscape restoration, um, which was uh, an approach that was um, really put together by IUCN and WWF back in 2000. And that is the approach that we take uh, uh, in our work with communities and other partners um, around the world when we look at restoration. And, and that's really looking at the landscape as a whole um, it's supporting uh, participatory governance within that landscape so that the voices of indigenous peoples and local communities can be heard in these efforts um, and community driven approaches can be utilized. Um, but it's also an approach that maintains and enhances natural ecosystems, including forests. So not only protecting uh, existing uh, forests, trying to keep them standing, but also when we look at, at, at planting and restoration efforts, using native species whenever possible and using a diversity of native species whenever possible, and also enabling natural regeneration to thrive where that is still happening. Uh, so that is the best case scenario, um, uh, that's, that's what really is going to ensure resilience uh, because that is um, diversity equals resilience. When you um, have too um, you know, many monocultures and uh, uh, too little diversity, you are, uh, you're putting the whole system at risk. And so um, I just wanna emphasize uh, the resilience aspects of things. Thank you. Thank you, friend. This, this brings back to what uh, uh, Maya just said earlier, is that uh, to, to achieve a sustainable approach of uh, reforestation or forest restoration, integrating biodiversity in the approach itself, having biodiversity by design in these approaches is very needed to make it sustainable. Uh, just as having local communities embedded in the conception and in the governance of projects on the ground. That's why I'm turning back to Virginie uh, Helias from Procter & Gamble. You said you've been working with, um, closely with Refresh Action on these aspects. And th the reason why the Open Diplomacy Institute has agreed to partner with Refresh Action to talk and advocate for forest, restoration, for forest protection and restoration is especially because they approach, their approach integrates uh, 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 taking into account local communities, social community-based approaches. Uh, how does it, how does it um, concrete, how does it materialize in the programs that you've run with them or with any other restoration company uh, uh, across the world as PNG strategy for forests? Thanks, Thomas. Actually, because Fran just uh, spoke, I will build on, on what she said and, and uh, mention uh, a specific program that we are doing as part of our investment in natural climate solution that we are building project, you know, for the next 10 years. And, and we are working with WWF to restore 15 million hectares of, of the Atlantic forest in, in Brazil, or in the state of uh, uh, Espirito Santo. And, and um, this is a project that is expected, you know, to, to lay the groundwork for restoring the forest landscape, obviously, but also to bring uh, a meaningful impacts on, on all these other uh, co-benefits of biodiversity, water, food security uh, for the local community. So uh, this is how we choose our project, you know. It is not only the project that brings the most uh, carbon benefits, which obviously we need to offset the emission we cannot reduce, but those are the quality projects that are bringing tangible benefits for, for the local communities. And so it's almost like making a, a call to project, you know, because we, we need uh, more of those uh, and uh, we'll invest, you know, for, for the next 10 years to, uh, uh, to make sure that the forest landscape thrive, but, but also the, the communities thrive with this investment. Thank you so much uh, for this very clear answer, Virginie. Uh, I, I've heard that... Um, in, in the course of our panel, and I think it's, it's Chris that has mentioned that word, that's why I'm turning back to Chris. It is 
it, we are on the verge of a shifting paradigm from forest sustainable management to a more circular bioeconomy that builds on nature, with nature. And I'd like to, to ask the question to you, Chris. Does, does this uh, uh, concept of bioeconomy resonate to the ISEN uh, work, specifically in this um, early stages of the UN decade on, decade on ecosystems restoration? Yeah, I think, um, <clears throat> thanks, Thomas. As, as, as I think you have on the panel earlier with, with Thomas, uh, with Mark Palahi, who's who's leading on the Circular Bio Alliance, Circular Bioeconomy Alliance, which which IUCN are involved in. Um, and we're heavily involved in, in setting, helping to define the principles behind that, which which very, very similar to the forest landscape restoration principles, very similar to the nature based solution standard. There's a lot of underlying principles in there that we've just heard are in relation to in relation to um, uh, in, uh, the social dynamics, the environmental dynamics, but also the economic dynamics of, of how this how this works. And and I, <clears throat> you know, I think that the, the, the big challenge that, that that is existing in 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 some of this is is how do, what does this look like on the ground, um, and what are the opportunities of it? And and, and as we've well, it's been very exciting through this thread. It has been the, that it's not just about trees, it's not just about forests, but it's about the ecosystem and the services that these all provide, whether it be to an agricultural system, whether it be to <clears throat> um, whether it be a primary forest and, and the, the, the values that, that the primary forests uh, produce. So it's it has you know there, there is a, there, that that on the ground action is is critical um there's there's a lot of talk about how you can integrate um forests into the built economy it comes with it with, with its own challenges and its own threats um one from actually the production system all the way through to 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 recycling future use etc um all, all the solutions that we're looking at have have challenges at different stages um so i think it goes back all the way around to those initial principles of of, of you know one protecting nature but two, also when we're restoring it, that we're, we're we're doing it in the right way, and we're not doing further harm. We're actually forward-looking and and achieving our aims. And and I think that that those those provide the the opportunity whether you're integrating trees into your farming system, whether it's watershed management, etc. I think they all provide various opportunities. And through through both our work on primary forests, through both our work on forest landscape restoration, and and through our work on agriculture. And through our working to climate change, those those principles are, are critical, um, and of, of how we look at it. And 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 even even if you move outside of the sector and some of the strong uh, out beyond the land based sectors, I think you you also need to look at what is the impact on nature first. And we recently report at least released a report on the on impact in mitigating the impacts on of renewable energy systems um, on biodiversity and the, 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 those solutions and how they impact. So there's, there's the great, you know, a lot of issues that need to be done, done and challenged. And that's when you go back to the landscape and the trade-offs in, in these planning processes. Uh, I'd like to bring back the sense of emergency that Louise has introduced the panel with in the keynote, because uh, we, we, we've been speaking about bright ideas on the way we should reshape the model we uh, envision a sustainable way of dealing with biodiversity in forest, which is very well articulated. But from there, we need to download results on the ground. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm turning to, I, I have two remaining questions. The first is for, for Maya and the second is for Fran. Um, I'm very curious on, do you think that this sort of emerging paradigm of bioeconomy or agroforestry will make a decisive change on the ground as indeed ecosystems are at mass risk of immediate extinction? Maya, do you think it, it, can, make, it can make an immediate result on the ground? Thank you, Tom. Unfortunately, there is no direct link between the development of agroforestry, for example, and the protection of forest biodiversity. As long as agriculture systems continue to replace forests with high ecological value, even if there are agroforestry systems, uh, even if there are agroforestry systems, we will continue to have a decline in forest biodiversity. 
agroforestry system must therefore be able to replace monospecific agricultural systems, cocoa plantation or palms, even pastoral land, so that greater agricultural biodiversity can develop, but without affecting biodiversity forests in the same way that trees should be brought back into cities and urban forests reconsidered. Trees should be remobilized for water management, watershed, rivering forests to fight against erosion, mangroves, wetlands, with trees for water purification, etc. Overall, if we take uh, the logic of mitigation, mitigating hierarchy, avoid, reduce, offset, there is a fundamental temporal dimension for forests that cannot be forgotten the long term. Compensation that should involve committing over several hundred years for some forest ecosystem cannot work for economic sectors. It does not make sense for companies. In France, for example, the compensation lasts only 30 years. So the challenge is to avoid and reduce and then we can restore the most degraded land. These are the three pillars that must be managed at the same time. Protection of forests, continue having protected areas to avoid destruction, reduction of impact by integrating biodiversity much more into sectorial policies, mainstreaming biodiversities and strategies against importing deforestation, and restoration of land and forest that that is very clear and it i think it's a very wonderful wrap of the agenda we need to re to to keep away and to take away from this uh, summit is conservation first restoration is needed and then reforestation might help but if we don't put this in that order, then anything won't be achieved at all. We, we will lose time. The, the, the offsetting or the benefits of reforestation come very later than the emergency war going on right now. Fran, do you share, do you share this view? Is this the right agenda to keep away from this summit? I think it is. I would also add in improved forest management. That is still important, even though um, uh, you know most of the threats are coming uh, to the forests and other ecosystems are coming from outside of the forest sector. Forest degradation is still a huge issue. It's not just deforestation. And so we do need to find um, new and build on traditional uh, knowledge to find approaches that are really gonna work going forward. Um, and um, we also need to not only get to implementation of existing ambitions, um, but we need to up our ambitions. We really need to think not only from our different, with our different hats on from our different sectors about what, our, what we have to do from a regulatory standpoint, we need leadership. We need to step out and, and beyond our comfort zone and address these issues as, as we can with our um, uh, you know, different sectoral hats on. And that, that relates to the policy realm. It relates to corporate com commitments and, and going beyond um, uh, even leadership commitments. Um, and uh, it, it relates to working with communities and empowering communities and recognizing uh, the rights of indigenous peoples. That's, that's going to be a huge part of what we need to be doing over the coming uh, years. Thank you so much, Fran. Uh, I think that the, the call for leadership and a strong sense of responsibility is exactly what we wanted to achieve with this Global Forest Summit, to bring together those who can make a change and I guess you could not make a, a better wrap to this conversation than this. I, I'll, I'll keep it there. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you. Uh, Louise first, uh, Isabella, Hans, Virginie, Fran, Maya, Chris, for being with us today at the Global Forest Summit. We will, we will end this conversation for now and meet uh, at 3.30 Central Eastern Time for the next session on forest and climate. See you later.